the juvenile dirt sprint. And there goes Golden Powell immediately to the early lead. Into the Sunrise and Momos are two lengths behind them already. And in between horses and moving up is Potenheimer as they head up the backstretch. And now Golden Powell, a little bit hard to control here. Potenheimer's going to slip through and take a narrow lead. Into the Sunrise is right up there. Bling the Booze is four deep. And then comes Momos, followed on the outside by Dirty Dangle and second of July on the extreme outside. Cowan is in behind them, about six lengths off the lead as they make their way around the turn. The Mighty Gurkha has been taken to the outside with five and a half lengths to make up. After five is going wide on the turn. You better believe it is down on the inside, about seven lengths off the lead. Flip is on is next, Windy City Red and Calpe Final, and they're into the stretch, and Golden Pal is kicked away again, and did he ever? Well, he's five in front as they come to the final furlong. Cowan on the outside has moved up into second. You better believe it has come up the rail. Golden Pal, another 16th to go. You better believe it is Cowan chasing him home, coming to the wire. It is Golden Pal winning the juvenile turn sprint. And then it was second, you better believe it was third, a three-way forward in a final battle, whoa, two, one, eight, two. There he is, Golden Pal winning the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint of 2020, avenging his damn lady Shipman, who came just a nostril short in the 2015 Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. And I have the great pleasure of having his trainer, Wesley Ward, here as my special guest. Wesley, okay, that was your fourth Breeders' Cup victory. And Golden Pal, did not disappoint in kicking things off the right way for a three-year-old season with victory in the quick call stakes this uh, opening day at Saratoga, where you are currently. So give us the lowdown. How thrilled are you? Obviously, you're happy, but just were you able to breathe that sigh of relief? Yeah, it's the, you know, we were really looking forward to this guy coming back. And he had, uh, as fast horses do, they got a lot of little minor issues you got to overcome. And um one being a, an ankle issue that Dr. McElraith, Wayne, Dr. Wayne McElraith, uh, really came in. He's an unbelievable surgeon, and he's done all my surgeries for well, since I started training. He's a great guy, and uh, he did a great job. And you know, the horse came back, and he ran just like he never left. So we're, we're excited. Well, I heard leading up to the race that he was going to be bigger, stronger. You had already said before the three-year-old debut that he's the best you think he's going to be the best horse you've trained where we're heading in that direction he's still got uh you know he's still got some some races that he's got to win to accomplish that but uh he's 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 certainly got ability that's just unreal you know to, to have a, a horse with with this quality in my barn is just uh, you know makes getting up easy you can't wait to get to the barn well, I remember, and I've said this many times before now, uh, ahead of the Breeders' Cup, just being at the barn and seeing the horses walk around and even without any, you know, seeing a nameplate or seeing any anything to be the big arrow saying this is Golden Pal <laughs> in terms of, a, you know, anything like a blanket or anything. I just knew it was him because of his presence. He really has this, as you even put it, jock presence about him where you know he's the man and he knows it himself apparently just by the way he carries himself um how do you feel he's developed as a three-year-old with the muscle and the mental maturity as well oh he's just you know he's he's bigger and stronger but he's still uh he's he's an athlete you know he's not he doesn't get too heavy he he's he's an easy horse to train and that you know he doesn't take a lot of training um to keep him where you want him to be but he is just like I said, and you were just talking, describing earlier. He's 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 like a college quarterback. You just can't <laughs> wait to get, get into the game. He's always at the front of the stall. He's got his head out and he's bobbing his head. He says, "Put me in, coach. I'm ready to go. <laughs> Don't leave me out." He, want, he wants to get out there and get on the track and train, and he loves what he's doing. Oh wow! Well, I I was talking to Randall Lowe, who bred and owned his dam and bred and owned Golden Pal, and this was his first start since Coolmore acquired him. Uh, the idea, obviously, you want to make a stud career now for this horse. And hopefully he, he'll have a successful career there, standing where his own sire, Uncle Mo, 2010's Eclipse champion, two-year-old, uh, is. And I, what's the added pressure with that? Is there an added? Yeah, I mean, he's, you know, it, it, we really need to get in there and, and get a grade or group one, one of the two. Um, to really stamp his value as a, as a stallion. I mean, he, he really has the talent to do that. Um, and just, you know, hopefully in his next start or two, he comes through. 
Well, he came back and put up a 95 buyer off the bench, which is pretty impressive. I mean, he'd been away, what, eight months? Yeah. I think. But, but what, really what was impressive is he really essentially only had three works. The other two were, were kind of open gallops with Julio Garcia on them. Um, so the, the he did that off of just three works. And that was what was amazing, you know. So wow. I think that that, re that race is really going to tighten him up and and put him where we need to be for his next start. Well, here is the Grade Three Quick Call opening day at Saratoga. What a way to start the meet! What were your impressions right out of the gate? Well, I was just happy that he broke good. You know, he hadn't been back to the to the starting <laughs> gate since the Breeders' Cup. So, um, and, you know, after that first jump, and then he he kind of broke with him, whereas normally he kind of just breaks a, a couple in front there uh then i you know then, then i was i was feeling pretty good at that stage you know as soon as we got around to the turn and he you know he was sort of in front there kind of commanding his position i thought wow we're going to be all right and then uh when we turned for home he, he, he had that same burst that he did last year at saratoga in the skidmore i, I was really you know it's, it's just special to have these kind of horses like i said earlier and, yeah and um you know to watch him do it in the afternoon in front of a you know, opening day Saratoga crowd. It's just, it's fantastic. He's just such a beautiful horse too. I, for very minimal chrome, uh, he's he really strikes a picture anyway, even with mostly a, he's got a, I think a back white sock, right? I can't remember exactly, a little footy back there, but he's still so striking in, even in that brown wrapper for the most part. And again, tremendous presence. We're talking now about the fact that wanting to get that greater group one and I believe the ultimate goal is going to be our turf sprint at Del Mar. But you were talking about the Nunthorpe, and I read an article in which you said he ran, you know, so, so big here in the quick call that maybe you're considering uh, going to the Cura instead. Have you, just, has your decision making making been refined any further since that comment? Or no, I mean, uh, he he came back very very well. Um, he, you know, I. I I was thinking, you know, you, it's all a question of when you put him out there in the afternoon and you, you let him go, you know, half mile and you see what his energy level is and how easy he does it. And if he's moving over the grass as comfortably as he has, you know, leading up to this race and and it's all just visually just watching him to see if he can do it. But I uh, and take on a, a task like going over to, you know, which is essentially the premier group one race in Europe is the Nunthorpe in York. And it's a race that sort of eluded me. I, I had a two-year-old filly for Coolmore named Acapulco. Yeah. So it's, it's a race for two-year-olds and up. Yes. And, and she got in with 112 pounds and, you know, Frankie and the boys that I use over there, they're, they're too heavy to do that. So I, I flew Irad over and it was harder getting Irad to the race because he's mm -hmm. so light, was able to do the race, do the weight. Uh, then actually getting the filly there. Oh, um, he, he had to take a helicopter because he was fighting for leader and rider here at Saratoga. So he didn't want to take off any days. Other oh, than wow. And, ride. and uh, so he rode that day and we, we got him a, uh, he, he went to the, to the, took a helicopter um, to the airport. And um, from, from there, we, we went uh, a direct flight to Manchester um, from Philadelphia and then he, he uh, we had to get him a helicopter back home immediately <laughs> after the race so he could ride the next day at Saratoga. We were second in the race. Oh, ran, a, ran a beautiful race. Yeah. Uh, it's the Philly got 112, and the older horses were 135, 140 wow. pounds. So it's a big weight weight difference for a two-year-old against older yeah. and, then, and then the next one we had Lady Aurelia in there with Frankie, and, and that's the race where we um, – Frankie thought he won the race. We got we lost by a half a centimeter. And after the race, Frankie stood up. I won. Why not? Here's a, here comes the photo and we lost. So I had two starts, two seconds, but maybe this guy can turn the tables. Oh, well, gosh. Uh, real quick, since you brought up Lady Aurelia, who, by the way, I believe is still the only uh, American-trained horse to win a win Cartier uh, two-year-old champion filly over there. I mean, what a season she had put together. Um, we actually met her ahead of the sale. Oh, and yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And there she was, I mean, obviously she'd never had, had a foal yet, but she was so sweet. You could tell the maternal instinct was there. She was so sweet with my little girl. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's so exciting to take these horses over there. And I remember after the Norfolk Stakes in which 
uh, Powell had run second, Kieran Fallon, there was a quote from him talking about him potentially going into the Nunthorpe out of there, where he would meet with older champion sprinter Batash, and he thought he could beat Batash at that point. Yeah, it would have been a great race, you know, especially the race he ran. We we didn't go when we raced here at Saratoga and ran phenomenally here. Yeah, in the Skidmore. Uh, but it was just, you know, during you know the height of COVID and trying to get everything organized, it, it just wasn't going to work out. Yeah, well, things worked out the way they, they needed to. And you got back to Royal Ascot. Uh, and Campanelli, I, what a tremendous performance she put in. Even though technically she gets the win in the Commonwealth Cup via a DQ, but she was right there. It wasn't one of these distant uh, second place finishes where the horse happens to be disqualified and you get the win that way. I mean, she really put in a gritty run and I have the video of that here. So let's take a look at Campanelli. And this, this was coming, she hadn't run since her fourth place finish in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies turf. And that had been her first defeat ever. Um, she's already a group one winner having won the pre knee. I mean, how, how, I mean, it, the obvious is it's amazing to win at Royal Ascot, but what is the nuance behind how wonderful it was to watch this filly come back and make such a strong counting of herself? Well, <laughs> she didn't have a prep race. Yeah. She, she had a few <laughs> minor issues as well that we, that, that set us back. So I was, you know, I knew that she would like the ground because she likes the heavy, deep ground. As you can see, they did six furlongs and one uh, 16 there. So the ground was really, really heavy. But I knew that wouldn't be an obstacle. Um, and I, I thought it might be for, for the opposition there. You don't know which ones in there would or would not take to the, yeah. to the soft turf. Um, here, when, when the colt went by us, I thought, well, you know, it was going to be a good run. And then she fought right back. Yeah, very, very game. And, um, you know, she made the lead with the with a few strides to go. And but as you can see, we were carried all the way across the course um, and uh, we were beaten on the line. And I just man, I was just I was proud of her. But I but I wish, you know, we could have won it on the squares. Um, but when I first came down to, to greet her and Frankie, uh, I ran into Aiden O'Brien and he told me, he says, I think you're coming Yep, I'm coming up. He says, I'm pretty sure you are. So <laughs> I, I had some hope there when they, someone like that tells you. I was so close anyway. I, I, and the thing is, like you, like you already mentioned, she, again, had not had any prep. Um, this, she has such a, she has such a strong constitution about herself. She, she has so much confidence in herself. We here in America don't often see Phillies run against the males. There it happens all the time. But what do you think it is that you recognize in a female racehorse that tells you, okay, let's throw her in, in the pre morning Let's throw her in in the Commonwealth Cup. Well, you know, on, on the grass, um, the horses get over it a lot easier than they do the dirt. Um, but the dirt as well. I mean, you, if you get fast horses, regardless of, you know, their Colts or Phillies, and they're at that level, you know, they're just as good, if not better, a lot of times. So that's why I really don't have a lot, a big issue putting the, the Phillies against the Colts. I've been very successful at it over the years. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, but it, it takes a certain one to do that, you know, and, and she's she is, you know, th that quality. So going back real quick now with the international uh yeah, you know, what you're looking for to target uh, with these international racings. So is the Nunthorpe for sure, the Coolmore Nunthorpe, or are we still entertaining the Flying Five, which would be at the Cura for Golden Pal? As I said, it's just all the, you know, watching him on the track and see how he's we'll doing see. and seeing if he recovers and comes back out of this race and how much this race took out of him or if he moved forward and he's even that much more better. Uh, that'll be told here in the next few weeks. The Nunthorpe, the Coolmore Nunthorpe, is going to be August 20th at York. The Flying Five, September 12th at the Cura. Both races are offering automatic birth into the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint at Del Mar. And then Campanelli, we're looking at the uh, Prix Maurice de Geest yeah. at Deauville. Yeah, like both horses, I would be great if there were races for them here, but they're just on. You know? <laughs> and, uh, unfortunately, you know, she's a six and a half, seven furlong Philly here at Saratoga is, uh, it's, you know, the only, the only, the only race five and a half. 
uh, and, and no further unless you go a mile. And there's just no group ones for our grade ones here in the, in the States for either horse. So, you know, pretty much have to head over the pond. Uh, well, how great was it being back there since you weren't able to go last year due to the COVID restrictions? I mean, apart from the actual win, which is amazing, but just the atmosphere and everything. Oh, it was great atmosphere. There was, you know, they, they limited the the people that could come in, but it was still nice, you know, to, to have people as we seen last year here at Saratoga with no fans. It was eerie uh, yeah. as well as, as Ascot was. There was just no fans there. It was, you know, it's almost like you're in a morning workout session, you know, and you're at the... Uh, you know, the big races. So it's, um, it's great to have everybody back here at Saratoga. And it's going to be great now that they've opened it up for everyone to come to the racing in Europe. So it's, it's going to, it's, it's going to be fantastic having everybody there around when we're running. Did you get to, uh, have a, 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 a nice, uh, reunion there with, uh, Frankie Dettori afterward, after the race and, and celebratory toast or drink or. Yeah, I'm lucky with that little fella. He's, uh, <laughs> he's a great guy too. He really is. He's a lot of fun. He's a great person. You know, I had, uh, uh, my oldest son, who's fine over there now, he's got all kinds of buddies, but my youngest son was with me, and of which is the same age as his, and he always Riley? made it a point uh, leading up to Ascot prior to the meet starting that he came over and he picked him up and he brought him to his house, and, and they had my son swimming with his boy, and he's just, you know, he's a, just a really good guy, you know, he, he not, not, doesn't just think of himself, he really thinks, uh, he, knew, he knew my son was there, didn't know anybody, and he went out Aww. of his way to pick him up couple different times and take him over to his house and it was he's really a good person did your son take any photos with his what i think he's like an ostrich or an emu or something there <laughs> yeah yeah that's my, that's my oldest son did that yeah that oh my fun. goodness how fun is that though I, and what a great relationship and what 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 charisma he brings to racing as a whole so i can only imagine with having you know something big to celebrate it, it must have been an extra good time uh but that wasn't the only success you had. You might, maybe not technically a victory, but uh, you had another horse run quite well over there, and that's Twilight Gleaming. She was second um, in, in, uh, over there in the Group 2 Queen Mary, and this was after setting the pace. She just got kind of passed late. Uh, what can you tell us about her? Because I think it's really interesting from a pedigree perspective. National Defense, who was a highweight in France, um, uh, he is – this is his freshman crop and to for her to come out there and represent him uh so well it must have been pretty cool but what was it that drew you to this filly with you know obviously a first crop sire freshman sire ben McElroy does a great job he bought uh, both fillies campanella and, and her um and you know throughout the winter as we're you know wine kind of narrowing and down the horses she kind of rose right up to the top right there it didn't take right to the to the end when we were getting ready for the entries that we chose her for the race um and they're both being owned by barbara you know she barbara yeah. Becky loves the racing over there and um they were broken trained at at both of them at, at her farm in ocala stone street by ann brennan so you know it's uh it's nice to have them go through the whole stages of their careers uh training careers to get to that point um, and she, uh, is probably going to go to France as well. Okay. Listed race over there, five furlongs, just as an accompany mate for Campanelle. You know, it's, uh, you know, there's no real race here other than the race here at Saratoga for, her. um, so usually you, when you're going to, as a, they'll, they'll be on a direct flight from, uh, Chicago to, to Charles de Gaulle in France on July 31st. And so if you have two together, this way they take the ride together, they, they ship a lot better. So that's why we're gonna drop her back to a listed race, more for her, for her buddy. Oh, well, I mean, I, she still, you know, she put in a, I have to mention a, a really strong performance at Belmont Park. Uh, she was second on debut at Keeneland, but that was on dirt. You moved her to the grass at Belmont and she won by seven and a half lengths in a five for a long sprint. <laughs> Yeah. And you know, this year it was, um, we had a lot of rain in Ascot. So, and she, she made all the pace with Johnny that day. Um, had the, had the course been a little firmer, you know, she may have turned the tables on, take nothing away from the other place. She ran mm -hmm. great, but, um, but it can she, definitely be tiring. You know, it's, yeah. it's, it's always a little bit of a, a favor if, if you get that hot, warm weather. So, you know, it's, you just never know, even though she was, she was born over there. Um, with her speed she has, it's just a little bit of an added weapon. And the other filly came from behind and beat us. But um, as I said, take nothing away because she ran fantastic. But I, I wish I would have had the, 
uh, a, a really firm, firm course that yeah. they can have some years. Well, you had some other two-year-olds there that we should mention. Um, maybe didn't go the way that you wanted, but still horses to watch nonetheless, because they did show a lot of quality here in the States before going over. Ruthin is another horse that you trained for Stone Street. She actually got a rising star designation from the Thoroughbred Daily News after her debut at Keeneland, but she was seventh in the Windsor Castle, but she represents first crop of the sensational Ribchester. So what are you looking forward uh, to with this filly? Um, you know, she's, she, that trip kind of took a little bit of a toll on her. So we'll give her a little bit of time, but, um, then the other horses, they just didn't fire like we were hoping. And they were in, uh, riding contention. Johnny had them all right in good positions. And, and as soon as they, uh, you know, the running started the last 10 jumps of the race, uh, they, 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 they just weren't there for them. You know, mm. so that, that happens some years. It and, does. Uh, it, unfortunately, it happened this year. <laughs> yeah, no. But, but we got lucky there the, the last day and, and had a winner, so it all worked out. But, you know, I really was I was very, very confident going into this year that I had a, you know, a real, real strong contingent. And there were a lot little, of little, little minor issues as you get home and you're kind of thinking uh, what things, how things went wrong and what you could have did different. You know, all their scopes, they came back with a little bit of mucus in them. You know, they mm -hmm. had no temperatures or anything that would warrant a scratch. And, you know, you would never know until after the race. If, right. But that, you know, so there might have been a little bug going around the barn that uh, that took away from from them, uh, you know, that last where, where John, when Johnny was right there and he needed them, they just weren't there for him. Well, I mean, I'm still going to be keeping my eye. Golden Bell, for example, uh, she she won her debut there at Keeneland. Uh, daughter of Mucho, Macho Uno, she's out of Peggy Mae by Lemon Drop Kid. The mom's an unraced daughter of champion and uh, multimillionaire Perfect Sting, who won the Breeders' Cup filly and mare turf back in 2000. So you got great pedigree there. You've got Coffee Maker, owned and bred by, Miss, uh, by Mr. Kaufman, uh, won his debut at Keeneland. Eighth in the group to Coventry, but uh, raised on your farm by Jimmy Creed of Heaven's Touch by Montbrook. Lucci, uh, one debut at Belmont, went on to run fifth in the Norfolk. Not a bad performance there. By not this time, out of Lucky Storm Warning by looking at Lucky. You got Nakatomi. Uh, that's a firing line out of Appalachia's by Flatter. You had Maven over there, a four-year-old. So how's Maven doing? Good. You know, he seems to run his best races at home in Keeneland, though. That's where he kind of rises up and does it. So <laughs> we're just kind of going to give him a little time uh, off of that because he ran such a big race in the spring and take him back slowly and uh, might not even run him until we get back to Keeneland just because, you know, we know how much of a fondness he has for, for his own track. But, right. Uh, you know, he's, and I'm sorry, uh, coffee maker, Philly, Philly, Philly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Co coffee maker, she was the biggest disappointment of the week. She'd been working so well you know, since her win yeah. and we got her on the grass and I was just ultra confident going in and Johnny had her right there in front. That's a tough distance, five, uh, three quarters over there and yeah. I put her against the boys. You know, we got a little weight break and, um, you know, she was a big favorite. You were right there, you know, leading up to the race. And like I said, she just didn't, didn't, didn't fire that last part for him. Well, you know, the thing is, I remember watching the video that they did. They did a they did a really nice package of you and getting the horses prepared there and their final works before going over at Keeneland. And all of them look tremendous. But it goes without saying, but I would love if you would elaborate just how difficult is it to take such a big contingent and with young horses, especially overseas to go against horses who I mean, that's their daily routine out there. Everything changes up. They train differently over there. Everything's different. Yes and no. I mean, um, I've had a lot of success going and, you know, now that it's been over a decade going over there and, and winning and losing, um, you know, I, I just, uh, it, it's no different than if you'd put a horse on a plane here at Saratoga and go to, to Del Mar or, or to Santa Anita, or they came, they came back here to run it either Belmont or, or Saratoga. So it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's, it's a lot, uh, timing wise it, you know, we, we leave Keeneland, we go to Indianapolis, we stay there for about an hour and a half, two hours, we get on the plane, and we go right to Stansted, and from Stansted we go right to their stall. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's about the same, if not even a little shorter, than if you get on a van from Keeneland or, or Churchill and van to Saratoga. Oh, so okay. You know, timing-wise, it's, yeah. it's not that much. And, you mm -hmm. know, and... When you're vanning to Saratoga, you always, you know, the horses are fighting that road all the time, you know. Yeah. And when you're flying, it's just, you know, 
smooth sailing. So it's uh, it's a lot easier on them to fly. Well, that's a great point. Do they? Do you tend to see that? How are the hydration levels with flying? It's no problem. When they get there, you know, we always have a vet right there, right, right when they get off the plane, and we uh, put the fluids into right back into them, and then they go right to. And, and as soon as they get there, I usually show arrive a few days after that, and they, they start gaining weight. I got to be careful because it's you know, where, they're, <laughs> where they're stable uh, over there in Europe. It's uh, it's almost like they're at a farm, so they just get very really really relaxed and get right into their routine. They're they're usually there 14 or 15 days out, and. Um, you know, you just kind of, kind of watch them because they really, it's, they really thrive. Well, speaking of thriving, your career has just thrived. I got to tell you, I was pulling up some, in, you know, just bullet point data to bring into the show about wins and, you know, just basically some career fun facts about you. And one of the things that I read, and I just thought it was too funny not to share because I never heard this story before, even though I've had you on the show. Um, but there's a story here about, try, okay, yeah. So your dad's a former jockey, uh, Dennis Ward, and you happened to be at Belmont at four years old. You were put on a pony <laughs> and he patted the back of the horse and he took off with you. And he started running after you, just like absolutely horrified that his four-year-old is being, <laughs> being uh, uh, taken away on board this horse um, at a gallop. and. He didn't get to you in time, but you you stopped the horse yourself. It says. <laughs> well, I, I'd love to tell you I could remember, but I can't. Right, I, mean, I don't. Die, but like the story, <laughs> I mean, how, how, how do your how your dad tell you? Oh no, come on. <laughs> no parent's gonna make that story up because it doesn't make the parent look especially, <laughs> especially you know as, as as one being on point, knowing where they're you know what's happening with their kid. That that's pretty funny. How many times have you heard that story? Yeah, well, my, my grandfather was the leading outrider here in New York, and that's how we got on the, the track. He was uh, he was the very first ABC Sports Mounted commentator where, when the horses were going into the gate for the Belmont. He would, oh, wow. he would ask all the jocks, hey, how's your horse feeling day? What do you think? Uh, you know, he was uh, kind of an animated guy, Jim Daly. So yes. um, uh, that's how we ended up coming back here. But And that's how actually I can end up coming back here to start my career riding because I'm originally from Washington State. Yes, and you are actually the uh, Eclipse Champion Apprentice Jockey of 1984. So I, we've talked about this that, before. That was 100 pounds ago. <laughs> 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 we talked about this. Well, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you got to love these jocks. I swear, what they put themselves through to, you know, what you were just talking about with making weight with a rat and, you know, for, for, for various races internationally and what you, they have to do here domestically. It's just insane, the, the routine that they have to maintain and still be, you know, still have the mental acuity to be able to react. I mean, if I haven't had a nice big meal, the brain drain is a real problem. So the fact that they're able to stay in these routines, they work out, they eat you know, not giant portions, but the healthy way. Um, but then they also have to stay just on point mentally while they're in these races. It's to me, so impressive, but because you have this absolutely well-rounded, uh, repertoire from riding to training to ownership also, um, I would be curious to get your take on this. So we just had the TVG.com Haskell run a win in your in for the Longines classic. By now, everybody has seen the replay. We, we saw hot rod, Charlie and, and Mandaloon, we're going to duke it out, but midnight bourbon happened to still be kind of in the way. And when, when Hot Rod Charlie came over, clipped heels with Midnight Bourbon. Midnight Bourbon nearly went all the way down, but he did lose Paco Lopez. He was able to gather himself back up, so nobody was hurt in any any bad, bad way where it would have been an absolute disaster. But because of this, Midnight Bourbon essentially did not finish. Therefore, with the disqualification of Hot Rod Charlie, he's placed to last. So what is your take on the situation from just all the different facets that you have yourself been in, in racing, when you look at something like that? You don't have the replay of that? I, I, I could pull it up, but I'd rather not show the horse going down. Well, if you watch a little bit, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm friends I could pull with it him. up. I could pull it up. I, I mean, well, everybody has, has seen I'm, it. I'm friends with Paco, and, and uh, one of my best friends, Cliff Collier, is, is great friends with his agent, uh, Corey. But Paco, I think, uh, 
if you kind of watch the from from prior to that, he's kind of all over the place riding everybody's horses, everybody else's horse in the race instead of his, which has been a trait of his. So I think um, a little bit of that, had he just maintained a straight course from the go, I don't think this would have been an issue. But um, so I would have, you know, if, if, if I was a steward, I'd take that into consideration also. Very and, interesting. Uh, but he, um, you know, I, I know that uh, whips are a big issue for the fans and the public. But, um, you know, if, if they can get a couple of reminders there at the, the last part of the race, you know, let, let, to let the best horse win. It certainly, it's never killed a horse, that's for sure. And, um, you know, they sell them at every tack shop. It's not like it's inhumane. I, I would like to see, you know, the best horse win, you know, the same thing that we've right. been doing for centuries. No, absolutely. I, I, I agree with you. And the, the thing is, and, and people I've seen some people say, well, he was allowed to use it for safety reasons. Why didn't he? I think it's because maybe, and I can't speak for, for Flavian Pratt, but um, people should understand with horses, a lot of times you have to do the correction before it is in any way obvious to somebody watching. Well, I mean, I think Flavian, it's, you know, it's the Hasco, it's a big race. You know, I'm sure he had a lecture from the stewards co coming in there, as, as most do, reminding them of the rules, no whips. And um, was he going to get down to the final stage of the race and switch sticks and hit the horse left-handed and, you know, possibly giving a suspension when he thought right. he was going to win it anyways. And, he, he, you know, he didn't really realize that uh, Paco was still there. You know, I, I, I know, I think you have to take everything into consideration. I, I you know, I, I, I don't really agree with this whip rule that they're – that they got in place there. Um, I think, you know, the, I, I think where they have it mandated a certain amount of, of strikes is fine. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, the whip anyways, um, but I, I would like to let the, the, the best horse win, win you know, yeah. you're talking about the last six or eight seconds of the race is all. So, I know. you know, I, I just, uh, I think that the people that are making the rules never been in a race, that's for sure. Well, we, now we will have to wait and see. I think at the next race for Hot Rod Charlie is going to be the Pacific Classic, and then hopefully we see him in the Classic itself, and then they can have that rematch throw down, and, and uh, hopefully, um, you know, all these horses do get to run their race. And that was the saddest part of it all for me is because I thought the horses all ran their race, and it, it can be a game of inches, and everything can happen in just such a split second like that, where, like you said, he was on his way to victory, it looked like, and then this incident happens and um i i don't know it's it, it's so tough um one thing we always hear about is how horses like to fill open space i mean that's why if you have a horse on the outside in a, in a starting gate sometimes you're worried he's going to bolt out um and and maybe just coming in to close that fill that space we had this situation happen um Somebody had made a comment about like, well, you know, the blinkers coming off or, or whatever. I don't know if that would make a difference. How when you're using different equipment, I know that you're very good with. Hey, we, we got, we, we've got David Flores here. David, Hi, David, David Flores. David, David, How are David, you? David's uh, working all my horses here for me at Saratoga. And we might have to have him bring him in on that whip subject on the next interview. <laughs> yeah, right. No, for sure. I Hey, how are you doing, David? Let me finish this. Sorry. Oh, okay. Right. So I was just saying hi to David. Um, but yeah, you're so hi good. Again. Hi again. Hi, it's so <laughs> nice to meet, see you. <laughs> so, you gotta love Saratoga, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's the thing. Like, you're so good also with understanding the equipment and whatnot. I, I know how, you know, for example, figure eight bridle can help give you more control in a horse. It can help, you know, also with air. Um, one thing I noticed, did Campanelli run before? It looked like she had a scoop on one side of her blinkers. She did. Um, you know, we kind of, we had blinkers on her last year and we took the blinkers off, um, after her win in, in Ascot to try to maybe s stretch her speed a little bit for the Breeders' Cup. You know, I, I was very confident last year going into the morning and I just didn't think that she would need it and it would help her for her next race. Um, and it did, uh, but in, in the morning itself, she broke and she kind of bears right. It's just a, a, a habit that she has. So... This year, as we were, they were training her in, in uh, Stone Street, you know, I went up a couple times for the, for the works and um, the gal that was working uh, her, she, she did a great job, but she still was just kind of hanging a little bit on the, on the left rein. 
And so when we brought her down to Palm Meadows, we tried her and she was kind of hanging a little bit. Mario Pino was breezing her and talking with him, I, I suggested, well, maybe we should go back with the blinkers and just the, the one blinker on the outside. Uh, and he, I said, let's give her a try. So when he breezed her, he said, yeah, absolutely. This is, a, this nice. is what we need. And from that point forward, it stayed on her and she stayed straight as a string. Um, so then when we brought her to over to England, we worked her in Newmarket with Frankie. Um, and I, I said, look, Frankie, we can go any, any direction you want. And when he breezed her with the blinker, he said, absolutely. Wesley. He says, uh, she just, she goes straight as a string. She doesn't need this, anything. Just leave that right on her. This is what I want. And I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. And so that's just a different, different type of equipment really, really helps the horses. Yeah, it, it really can make such a huge difference. And that's one of the things I always find so interesting because for those out there who play the horses, who handicap a lot of times, some of the things that make the biggest difference in the world for a racehorse, there's no, there's no notice of it in the form. Obviously we have blinkers on, blinkers off, but there's different type of blinkers. There's different type of bits. There's all sorts of different equipment that can be applied to a horse that you would have no idea could make all the world of difference. Um, to how they perform. Um, so let's now get back real quick to your two-year-olds because I don't want to monopolize your time and you've got just so many great horses. Now, uh, one of these horses that's very exciting who we did not get to see who had been entered in the grade three Schuylerville is Happy Soul, a daughter of 2015's Eclipse Champion Sprinter and Breeders' Cup Sprint Champ, Run Happy. Um, and you know this filly so talented you put her in against the boys she's one of these horses that you put in against the boys on debut she set the pace ended up finishing second beaten by her stable mate nakatomi this was over sloppy sealed going going four and a half furlongs at keeneland then she came back and absolutely decimated a main special weight field at belmont going five winning by 11 and three quarter lengths and then you went to the Astoria, five and a half furlongs. She crushes by 11 and a half. I have that replay. We'll show it. But while I'm showing it, give us your your, your take on this filly. You know, she um, she was beaten the first time we ran her. I, I really liked her that day. Uh, but the winner, Nakatomi, he just ran incredible. Like he's one of those horses that just doesn't show a lot in the morning. And I, I actually favored her in the race of the, of the two. Um, and then when I came back with the, with her at Belmont, she just kind of bounded away and went easy. And my plan was to wait for the till the Sky, Skylerville, but um, the owner has been a been a great owner for many many years, Gayla Rankin. And it just looked at, like a race that we couldn't pass up, that we couldn't lose, especially having a run happy and 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 getting a stakes win for. I just wanted to, for monetary reasons, I put her in the in this race. For her, I mean, she didn't have a work from race to uh, from her last race to this one, and you know, just looked like as as you can see, she was one to nine. She kind of towered over the field on paper with ability wise. I was a little concerned that you know it was kind of back on short rest, and this third start back with a two year old uh, this early in the season, something I rarely, if ever, have done. And um, she just she just dominated the the race, wow. just just like her odds sh uh, shown there. And um, <laughs> we, she, she came back and she's been doing great. So we, you know, I, where I had originally planned on going the Adirondack, I thought, well, we'll get, let's, let's see if we can't get Gayla a graded win. And she's actually been working with Kamari. I know. So, so that was, you know, even more impressive. They've been going down there in 59 at, at Keeneland in, in a few of the works. So that she's, you know, Kamari visually was better, but she was, she was right there. Julio just sat right back off of her and just kind of, eased up to within a neck of her but you could tell visually she was better but for even to to do that was very very impressive and unfortunately um she was good uh, schooling here the day before the race in the morning up she spiked the temperature oh. and uh, she's doing she's coming right back around now it took a few days but uh, the vet uh, dr castro has been on it ever on her every day and we've been pulling bloods uh, every morning and uh, the blood looks really really good now and it looks like a few more days she'll be back on the track and and doing well well, you have so many options with her. Uh, so again, by Run Happy, out of Cowgirl Lucky. Cowgirl Lucky's a daughter of Stephen Got Even, and it's kind of funny because Stephen Got Even, back in the day, his first stakes win was the GalleryFurniture.com. So it's kind of funny that he's the he's the broodmare sire, and that Run Happy, 
gallery furniture is the sire. Uh, but yes, of course, even got even, he went on to win the grade one Don. And the other thing is, and I've noticed this with a lot of your horses, a lot of your horses and their pedigrees, their, their female family includes horses who's, who are named, uh, who are the namesakes of stakes races now. And in this case, She's tail female to the Della Rose, who was champion turfer of 1981. She was second in the Kentucky Oaks, so very versatile horse. She actually beat males also in the Hollywood Derby. So, yeah, just a really exciting filly. She put together back-to-back -to -back buyers of 81. It just looks like the sky's the limit now that she's healthy. I mean, what, do you, how do you get a horse back into the swing after having over, you know, having had a bit of a... I mean, is there, you know, fever, spiking a fever like that? I mean, is it a slower process? How do you also keep the rest of your horses from coming down with it? Uh, she's pretty much isolated. And, and you know, she, they'll tell you when they're when they're back. You can see by their demeanor that, you know, they start bouncing around the barn. And right now she's still a little bit low, you know, and not, not uh, mm -hmm. back to her usual self, even though she's a quiet filly. You know, when, you, when you're watching them every day, it's just like you're watching your, your children. Right. Yeah, you, know, you can you can tell when they're sick and, and when they're not and when they're coming out of being sick. You know, it's the same thing with these horses. You just watch watch how they are each and every day, and you can tell when they're back in their normal routine and in their normal behavior. Well, you know, one of the things that I remember you saying regarding part of the reason you feel you get such an edge with the two year olds, especially, is because you really do take the hands on approach down there in Florida, and you you're working with them. Um, what what else is it about about getting these horses not only ready to perform early, but then keeping them going later into their season and then hopefully having them make the transition into being a horse like Golden Pal who can come back after a long time away or a Campanelli and at three years old pick up where they left off? You know, that's one thing I sort of picked up by going over to Europe is they give them the winners off. And when I, you know, the first 17 years of my career, I trained out in California and as you know, uh, January is the same as August. You know, there's yeah. stakes races all year round. There's, you know, you just, you change tracks, but still you're, 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 you know, so if a horse gets injured or hurt, that's when they, that's when you give them the time off and you bring them back whatever month they, they're, they're fine to come back at. And I, I really, and as soon as I came back here, we kind of go from, you know, Keeneland in the spring to Saratoga or Belmont, Saratoga and, and Keeneland in the fall. And then everybody's going down, getting ready for Gulfstream. And it's sort of year round where when, when I kind of took a good look at how they were doing it in Europe and my better horses now, I try to give them the winners off. I, you know, it's just hard for them to sustain, you know, 12 months a year. So, if, yeah. you know, right after the Breeders' Cup or if there's a race after that, which normally, you know, the top ones are in the Breeders' Cup, we're, we're looking to go to, uh, you know, to Barbara's farm if she owns them or whoever respective farms that the owners go to and give them a couple of months off and then get them back in uh, late January or February and have them ready to, to when, when Keeneland kicks off in the spring and then they can, they can go through the, the spring, summer and fall. And just that, that little bit of a break really helps them now. I found uh, to, for longevity to, for, for their careers, they can go, you know, like Kamari, you know, two, three, four or five, you know, so it's uh, if you give them those winners off to really to where they can rest up and then they're, they're ready to, to go back out there. Well, that's who I want to talk about next is Kamari. I've told this to you before, and it's okay if you forgot, but I have a, I have a soft spot in my heart for Kamari because she's actually tail female to the same family that includes a horse that my family used to own. So I just feel a connection to her because of that. Um, it, she's such an exciting horse, and she she really uh, made <laughs> made uh, you know 2021 already a season to look out for. She's two for two. She's coming off a win in the grade one Madison. And I believe she's targeting this weekend's uh, honorable miss, correct? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have the video of her Madison here and let's just go ahead and share the screen and how, how I know, I know it, it, again, it's the obvious answer, but I know I'm sure there's also more nuance to it. You know, how rewarding is it to have a Philly like this still, you know, kicking on and, and throwing down at grade one level. Well, you know, we, we, we've had her since a yearling, so she's, uh, Ben McElroy as well picked this filly out. And um, the owner I know for, since I'm, before I was 16 years old, he's from Washington State, Dave Mowat. Wow. I knew him back from Yakima Meadows days. And uh, so it's nice to have a, a connection going back uh, decades, you know, with, yeah. with the owner. 
and she, you know, as you can see, she's very, very fast. And yeah. uh, Joelle did a great job in getting her off the leader there. Um, and uh, you know, we we had everything our way because she's she's got the outside post. You know, had we been trapped inside there, because usually she she'll break a step or two slow her whole career ever since she's a, a baby, yeah. which is a little bit ironic for one of my horses to do that. But she does. <laughs> it's kind of a habit she has. Um, so so we had you know, like I just said, we had everything our way. And Joe, Joel, he was he was really on a roll here at this meet. He was winning everything at Keeneland. Um, and so, you know, Turner for home here, he was just sitting there cruising. And I was uh, uh, about when we when they got up here to to the eighth pole, I was I was starting to yell at him to, to, to let her go. And as you can see, he, he still hasn't <laughs> uh, yelling at him even more about here. And I think here he finally heard me here just inside the 16th pole and he let her go. <laughs> oh my gosh. Right. I love it. Well, I, that's the thing with your background also as a jockey, do you feel you have even more of a say when you're, when you have an idea of how to no put those little buggers up as well as when I was there, it's all on them. <laughs> <laughs> But all this time and effort, and just like me, I, you know, you, you can, uh, when, when I was riding, uh, I'm sure I had, you know, more, more the, more so the, the trainers cursing at me when I got off them than when they were throwing me up. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful, beautiful, oh, yeah, horse she is also. And, you know, the thing, talking about versatility, uh, I, this is a filly who actually, you know, she was second in the group two Queen Mary herself. She won the bolt landing, was a winner in the Indian summer over males, uh, and then fourth in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint, but she had trouble. She had a troubled trip. And do you think that was due to the slow start out of the gate? Yeah. Yeah. She, she you know, historically, she's always come out a little slow. So, you know, in the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile, where I, the, the race I won with um, – Four wheel drive. If you watch the the end of the just after the finish line, she's four or five in front. She was yeah. blown by him. So you know, it just it, it makes it tough for the riders when you're going short and and they break slow and and you've got so much horse. And she was, I think she was about last turner for home. So we knew we had something special though. Yeah, and it, hey, you did like you just said, you did win the race with four wheel drive. But it, it's it's got a well, that's another thing. It's kind of fun. You won it back to back the juvenile turf sprint first with him and then with Golden Pal. But I'm sure you would have loved a dead heat in that race. Uh, but then, yeah, she she wins the Purple Martin. She's second in the Commonwealth Cup. Uh, she then comes back uh, here at Kentucky Downs, third in the Music City, wins the Spring Fever to start off uh, 2021. And now the Madison Stakes grade one winner. And the it's just a really, really uh, impressive thing to me to see a horse like this show such versatility. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, hopefully we, she's around next year. I'm, uh, I'm going to be leaning on Dave Mowat uh, to, to keep her going next year. Cause you know, it, it, it's, it's very, very hard for me to, to get a horse like this. And as Dave Mowat has said himself, you know, he, he doesn't know how many he'll have. So uh, as, as good as she is and as soundy as she is, she's a, she's a very valuable commodity right now. If they, if, if she goes in the sale here in the, in the fall of the year, but, um, you know, she's not going to lose that. Uh, she won't lose that value. That's for sure. So I'll be yeah. leaning on Dave to give her another year, but we'll see what he says. Well, she's four years old now. How do you keep up? We always hear about with female horses in particular, they start to think about mommyhood and everything. Has that been the case with you? Do you see that quite often with mares or do you think that's well, something that's maybe no, a little think, stereotypical? They just, they just sort of lose that sizzle that you can see in the races and, you know, you'll give them a, a race or two, but if they don't kind of pop back, then pretty much that fight's kind of gone. And then just as you said, they're, they're ready to, to head to their next career. Well, one of the other things, somebody just made this comment and it's a perfect segue because I want to end the show on a note uh, about another special horse because you just have an absolute knack. I mean, you have, you have some of the most royally bred horses and then you've been able to find horses who are really well bred, but for whatever reasons, a reason there is diamond in the rough still. And one of those horses being Judy the Beauty my favorite Wesley Ward trained horse, Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Sprint winner from 2014. That mare had so much heart. And you know what, Lawrence? I have that replay ready to go right here. Um, $20,000, I think you got her for? Yeah. Ridiculous. That How did this bargain. happen? That was How? a bargain. Why? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Nobody was really there that day except for me. So it was uh, it was great that I was there to, to get her. Um, and, you know, as I've said, and Mr. Well, she, she was in the Hall of Fame in um, – 
Canada when she got inducted. Mr. Stronick gave me the the award, and and he was, you know, very kind and gracious in saying that you know if he had owned her, it would just been another great one of his many other great horses that he owned. Uh, but you know, he says I'm glad that Wesley got her because it changed his life, and she did. You know, oh. she just put me on another. Uh, but my, my family, you know, my kids, yeah. uh, my son just graduated with an MBA at the University of Miami. My daughter's mm -hmm. going to the University of Miami. And uh, my youngest son, Jack's going to boarding school in, in Massachusetts. And a lot of that is attributed to this filly. I mean, it, she's she earned nearly $2 million. And, um, you know, besides that, she also put me, you know, in, in a good light with the owners where they, you know, they, they feel comfortable giving me their horses at, at this level. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I bet she's, she's just, you know, it's a, if you stay in racing long enough, Bruce Headley once told me, you're, you know, everybody's going to get a shot and get a good horse. And, and thank God I got one. Well, Judy, the beauty, uh, you told me that you named her that because it was just fitting. She was a beauty. And uh, I, again, I, it just stuns me that she went through the ring for $20,000. This was at Keeneland September, um, back in 2010. She what just, is here, right here, though, I'll tell you what, she almost brings tears to your eyes, man, because this, this ghost hopper filly on the outside came to her and really should have went by her right here. But you can tell she just said, no, nah, it isn't going to happen. She put her head down and just kept, kept running. And so many of those races, she did the same thing. She's just a really, really special horse. And she'll always have a, a home at my farm till forever. And she's just fantastic. Well, that's the thing. You still, oh, well, we can watch the slow motion of her just digging in, still saying, nope, it's mine. <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, so like you just said, you still have her. Uh, she's had a couple of foals. We haven't seen any of her foals race yet, but I do know, or I looked it up, and so you can confirm if this is true or not. She has an American pharaoh filly, which way, who's been bred to Nyquist. Yeah, has a Nyquist foal. Philly. Oh, nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. A Philly. Nyquist. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Of course, he's one of only two horses who ever won, ever won the Breeders' Cup Juvenile and then go on to win the Kentucky Derby. So I expect that this is going to be a precocious, a precocious Philly. Uh, and then she does have a Curlin Colt. Uh, yeah, she has two Curlins. She has a Curlin yearling Philly and a Curlin two-year-old. And is the two-year-old's name Shady something? Shady? Shady Pass. Shady Pass. Yeah. Well, and, you know, what's the backstory there? <laughs> well, we're I, I, I got an, I got a little bit of an outlaw back here that's worked for me for thirty years, so we're we're not going to tell the story unless he makes it. So, oh, okay, makes it, then we'll bring the story to prominence. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so <laughs> okay, well, I get to break it then. You you got to tell me what it is. Uh, so so how exciting is it for you to to have a have had a champion like this, and now you're seeing the foals? Are you seeing the same quality reflected in them that? You know, the, the same nuances or trait, whether physical or just care, you know, uh, the personality wise. Yeah, they're all kind of laid back and they are kind of quirky like she was. So, um, you know, they, they are following the, the mother's traits a lot. And uh, we're praying that they, they have the ability she has or even half of. We'll take half of. <laughs> all right. Right on. So, OK, so we're going to be looking for them down the pipeline. We did mention Happy Soul uh, real quick. I'll just say we other the other two year old that you had. Uh, she didn't she had to be scratched from the Skylar field, but you did have a horse in the Sanford. That's headline report. He ended up running second. I know Wit kind of crushed uh, in the Sanford, but still nice to get a second place in a race like that with that type of. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, storied, storied past. And this horse is a son of Gormley out of a tail of a cat mare named Green Eyed Cat. And actually the fun thing about this horse, and this is another one of those instances in which I uh, had mentioned before, you have so many horses with horses in the pedigree who now have stakes named after them. Uh, this is a, uh, this mare here is, let me see here. I'm just making sure I've got it right. The grandmother's grade one winning millionaire critical eye. Yeah. So that's pretty fun. Critical Eye was, I think there was only eight New York bred fillies who went over a million dollars in earnings. She was one of them uh, there at Belmont, just throwing down, uh, won the Gazelle, won the Hempstead. She also won the Great Two Sheeps Head Bay. So a, a very, a very exciting prospect there. I just had to bring him back up because I felt like I skipped over him by accident. I didn't want to leave that out. How did he come out of the race? Oh, good, good. Very, very good. He just, um, 
you know, we didn't have any excuses. He broke sharp. Johnny had him right there. And Johnny said when he turned for home, he was going to, he knew he was blown by the horse on the lead. And then all of a sudden he looked to the right and he said, what the heck is this? You know, <laughs> so, you know that horse was just uh, much better than us on the day. But, you know, essentially that was our guy's first start. You know, he, he had uh, the one start at Keeneland. And yeah. uh, he was pretty green and I had just got him. I just bought him from the sale and just had a couple of works and we ran him. And so, you know, I gave him a couple months, you know, to kind of let down and bring him right back to this. So, you know, I was, I was proud of him. I think he's, he's a big colt. He's going to move forward. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't know if we're going to catch that Todd horse. So he's something else. What do you think? What's the, the two-year-old colt to be looking at going forward? Have you, do you have a horse in your barn who we've not seen? I got a filly coming up that we're uh, going to enter tomorrow. That's really, really nice. Charlie O'Connor uh, really? has a group together, and including himself, that owns uh, named Her World. It's a Caravaggio that's <gasps> very, very nice in the mornings, very impressive. And um, Johnny Breezer here the other day on the grass, and um, he was very impressed. That was the first time Johnny was on her. So, you know, hopefully she, she runs to her works. And, um, you know, Saratoga, so I'm sure it's going to be, there'll be others in there just like her, but she, she's very, very talented. I do love Caravaggio and his foals are running. Uh, he, he's absolutely beautiful too. He looks like a Pegasus without wings. I happened to be out there at Coolmore and they brought him out and he's just so impressive. So I'm excited. Well, again, what was her name? Her world. We're gonna we're gonna her enter world. against the boys. You know, we get a little bit of a weight break. And I Johnny's, love it. Johnny's pretty light, and I've been as we talked earlier. I've been a little successful doing that, so we'll see if it comes true. Was it you that told me that the reason part of the reason why you don't have as much of a, you know you don't have as many reservations going into a position like that with a filly because you feel to, feel two year old fillies actually mature physically and mentally a little bit faster than the boys do. Yeah. You know, if you look at the two-year-old training sales times, I, you know, this is what I told you in one of the past interviews. There, it just seems like the, the Phillies have the majority of the quicker workouts. Um, so I just I just think they just come around a lot quicker. Yeah. And, and again, I, we do see this quite often in Europe. It's just here for whatever reason. Uh, I, we don't have as many trainers taking the big shot like you do with them, but it's certainly exciting. And okay, okay bottom line. So I'll wrap it up with you. You've been so generous with your time. I hope you didn't get sunburnt out there. <laughs> no, we're good. Okay, good. So, so what do we have to look forward to in terms of, of anything that we've not seen besides her? Um, and also, your 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 dream scenario for getting golden pal into the juvenile turf sprint and campanelli what are, ultimately what is the goal for her well unfortunately like i said it's just or in the uh, turf sprint i just said juvenile again yeah, <laughs> I'm so well, used to it. the turf sprint. That's reason why we're going over to france um that fit that race is just perfect it's uh, six and a half furlongs it's on a straight course in deauville the same course she won on last year so we know she likes it and if it comes up rain that day which uh, it does a lot in Deauville. You know, we know that's not going to be an issue, so the ground won't be a problem. Um, so that we're, we're excited about that. And then we'll, we'll make a plan with, with Barbara and, and her team and, and Ben McElroy and, you know, see what, what, what we'll do from there if she's successful. Um, and with Golden Pal, we're going to be looking at uh, the race in York or the race in Ireland. I'd really like to go to that race in York. I think that race, you know, I, I'm familiar with it. I know the trip. I know what it takes to, you know, travel wise to get him there. And I'm very comfortable with that. Um, Ireland's a little bit foreign for me, so I don't know what the logistics of doing that as I've never run one there, but uh, we'll get him home and then we'll probably make a plan for the Breeders' Cup from there, um, whether he runs again or trains into the race. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, if, if we're successful. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it all goes well. Well, it sounds exciting no matter what and what a jet setter you are. It's it's really incredible. I'm sure you sometimes sit back and just reflect on how far these horses have taken you around the world, uh, not only in your capacity as a trainer, but as a jockey, I know you win international. And yeah, they've, they've been so wonderful to me. You know, I've got a, a field full of retired horses there in my farm and, Aww. you know, we, we turn them into to ponies eventually. And then you know, we get them, we always make sure that we give them the really, really good homes. And uh, as soon as I give one, uh, make sure he goes to a good home there. Here comes three more up there. So <laughs> I can't get rid of that field. <laughs> oh, no, no. It's great. It's great. And you're, and it's so great. One of the, one of the things that always, that warms my heart every time I see that golden pal replay from the juvenile 
is you with your son there at the end and you giving him that big kiss. And it just, it warms my heart because again, your grandfather, your father, now your boys are getting to enjoy the ride with you. And well, I'll tell you, I started in this game when I was very, very young, 16. And, you know, prior to that, on my 16th birthday was when I rode my first race. So prior to that, I had a lot of, a lot of mornings at the track. Um, so educationally, uh, formal educationally stopped there. And to have a son that got an MBA in the University of Miami, um, and now he's going to the UK, he starts next month in UK for law school. I'll tell you, I, I, I can't even believe he's my son. I mean, just, that's way, way, and I, from the bottom of my heart, I mean, that's when, when, when he walked down that aisle and the, where I was watching him there, I just, I couldn't believe it. I just, I couldn't believe that I, that my son actually got an MBA from the University of Miami. It was the greatest accomplishment. I know I didn't do it, but <laughs> I, I couldn't believe it. You know, and it's just, it just, uh, I've always been a stickler for my kids for education. My daughter's uh, going to the University of Miami, like I said earlier, and uh, for and my, my youngest son's in boarding school. And uh, to, get, to have them have that educational background where it's going to open up so many doors, as you know, Ren. Yeah. Um, you know, when you have that education behind them. And, and I, you know, I, I have zero, but I have a, a master's in the racetrack. This is all I got right there. <laughs> and but I'm happy. I, mean, I wouldn't change it for the world. But, but to, 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 have, to have these kids of mine, you know, and, and it's attributed to the, the, the horses. You know, I, I'm here each and every day. And uh, the only vacations, unfortunately, that my kids get is uh, going. And they've had great vacations going over to Europe uh, with me. I take them all with me and, um, and, and that. So they've, they've got great experiences. But it's, uh, these horses have taken me all over the world. You know, it's just... Uh, you know, it's something that, uh, you know, a lot of uh, friends of mine that, are, that aren't, uh, have nothing to do with the horses so, or that way. I want to show you one last one last guy here. It's Bound for Nowhere. <laughs> oh, Bound for Nowhere, yes! How is Bound for Isn't Nowhere that? doing? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, okay, wait, he was last yeah, third, third in the Jiper? Oh, where's Kamari? <sighs> Kamari, oh my gosh, I want to kiss that nose. <laughs> oh my gosh, is the big Here's man there? Hopeful, we just gave you, we gave you. This is her world, the Caravaggio. Oh my gosh, hi, beautiful. <laughs> oh my gosh, she's so pretty. Yeah. Where's That's Pal? Right. Look at me, I'm like, where's Pal? <laughs> That's I, how wonderful is that, though? I mean, you, you just talked about education masters and in, in, in you know being at the track but seriously i think it's kind of fitting that you're known for for getting these horses ready from the gate right you do take yeah, credit for, uh, you do yeah. take credit for your kids you got them in the Wait gate I, I gotta give you the the judy the beauty what, what's her name again the judy the beauty folds what's her oh, name so he can oh, hear it he can oh, hear it shady shady passed or the, we're going to tell y'all, if he makes it, hey, yeah. I'm, I had a JD pass too, man. <laughs> we're going to, we're going we're gonna to tell you the story once he makes it. Right. <laughs> yes. I need that story is my scoop. You guys got to bring me the there scoop on shady pass because that's just, um, too, <laughs> too enticing not to get the inside <laughs> track on for sure. Oh my gosh. No, it's so great. It's so great. How do you not love that? You, I, again, you, I, it, what I, I was trying to say regarding your sons, you said you don't want to take credit, but like children are a product of their environment. You've got them in the gate. You got them. You got them out the gate with alacrity, and now they're they're ready to be Grade One winners. I, I, and these horses, I mean, the starting gate in a way also is almost symbolic of as being a gate to the world. And like you said, you guys have traveled the world together. I think it's absolutely remarkable. Yeah, it is. Um... You know, he's been to Dubai with me. He's been, he's been to Hong Kong with me. Wow. Um, and so he's, you know, he's got a, he's got a worldwide education. You know, my children do from, from going all over with me. And they, it's just something that these, you know, I love the horses and, and, and uh, we're going to make sure we, we take care of each and every one of them. I'll tell you that. Well, I so appreciate this lovely time spent because I, I these horses have all just been so impressive. We root for them. Here, we root for you. Right oh, is that? This is, this is a filly called Blue Lily. Oh, Blue Lily. She, she came, my friend uh, from England, um, 
Alex Cole sent her over to me. And uh, she's kind of a star walker. Oh, okay. They had some issues with her, but look at her now. She's, yeah. We, we got an outside stall here. She's nice and chill. And she just hanging out. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my so gosh. We got, uh, we got everything here at Saratoga. Hopefully, everybody comes, and anybody that comes are always welcome. Come on over. Oh, well, I wish I could get up to Saratoga. It doesn't look like it's going to be in the plans for this meet, sadly. Um, but when you come back to, to Keeneland, <laughs> it would be fun to do one of these in person and see the horses in person. And uh, do, oh, do a, a here's happy soul. Here's happy oh, soul. there she is. She's feeling better. Oh, hi, baby. So I know Gayla, Gayla Rankin will be watching the show tonight. She can see her. <laughs> oh, she looks happy. She does. She looks happy yep. and content. Just doing her thing. Oh, I love it so much. Saratoga, there's really no place like it. So, well, thank How? you for having me on, Rand. Oh, I appreciate gosh. it. Gosh, no, the, the, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you so much for all the insight, the stories. And we, we root for you, Wesley. We really do. My mom, actually, i got to go back here. She, she couldn't help. She, she posted many times to this. The man with the great smile. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There you go. She loves it. Well, you have plenty of reasons to smile. And thank you for, for making us smile as well. Again, we're rooting for you and look forward to hearing more. And I really am going to be rooting for, for Shady Pass because I just want to hear the story on that horse now. <laughs> no, I don't know if you do. <laughs> <laughs> I think I can handle it. So, all right, everybody, my very special guest, Wesley Ward. This has been your Future Stars forecast on a two-year-old Tuesday. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, Rand. Have a good night. Thank you so much, Wesley. You too. Okay.